My name is Ann Taves. I'm a professor here in the Department of Religious Studies and also the uh, supervisor of the Religion, Experience, and Mind Lab Group, which is hosting this event. Well, maybe I'll wait just a minute here. <laughs> Okay, so um, the, religious, the Religion, Experience in Mind Lab Group is hosting this event along with the Department of Religious Studies and our co-sponsors, the Cognitive Science Emphasis and the Department of Anthropology. Before introducing Professor Block, I'd like to thank um, the lab group members, Elliot Eim and Judd Foreman, and my department chair, uh, Kathy Moore, who helped organize the event and secure funding. And on the funding front, I'd especially like to thank the Associated Students uh, Community <coughs> Affairs Board, whose generous support, uh, combined with contributions from our department, the CAP Center, and our co-sponsors, have made this event possible. So turning now to our speaker, Maurice Block, he is the Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at the London School of Economics, where he taught for many years. He's known for his many publications on topics such as imagination, ritual, cultural transmission, and the nature of the social, much of it grounded in his fieldwork in Madagascar. He's also well known as a prominent advocate for building links between the evolutionary cognitive sciences and cultural anthropology. So let me say just a little bit about what that means, at least as I understand it from his work. In terms of background, in my experience, let me just say that UCSB prides itself on its uh, interdisciplinary research. But as far as I can tell, much of that takes place within the different uh, divisions of the university, so within the natural sciences or the social sciences or the humanities. Interdisciplinary research across these divisions is less, com is less common and sometimes generates controversy. Because anthropologists study humans from many different perspectives, anthropology departments have sometimes been a site of tension, even conflict, between anthropologists who are focused on social and cultural differences and anthropologists who study humans from psychological, biological, or evolutionary perspectives. Building bridges within anthropology thus, I think, has the potential to suggest ways we might better connect the humanistic study of art, literature, music, and even religion with psychological and evolutionary perspectives on humans as social culture-making animals, and thus to promote a more integrated approach to the social sciences. So how does Professor Block build these bridges? As a cultural anthropologist, he often starts on the more humanistic side of the bridge with an account of something that happened in the field. It could be something that sounds quite ordinary to us, such as the morning greeting of villagers, or something that sounds more unusual, such as references to ancestors as the cause of illness or misfortune. But he's always aware that there's more going on than immediately meets the eye. All of us bring implicit, unstated knowledge to what we say and do, and in most cases, this works out just fine because those with whom we are interacting also share that knowledge. Cognitive anthropologists and evolutionary psychologists have been particularly attuned to this implicit shared knowledge, which may be culture specific or quite general, extending sometimes even to other animals or to some combination of both. As a bridge builder, Professor Block wants to insist that we need to understand both what people are saying and doing and the implicit knowledge that they bring to their everyday interactions. In exploring the intersection between these two things, he'll take us beyond the realm of shared knowledge into the realm of shared imagination, which he argues lies at the foundation of our highly developed 
so human social worlds. All these themes come together in his talk for today, shared imagination in the morning greetings of villagers, the implications for human evolution. Please join me in welcoming Professor Block. Well, thank you very, very much <laughs> for introducing me here. Um, I, I've come here, actually, from a, a meeting on human evolution. And so I'll take uh, some of the issues which came up there as my starting point for what I'm going to talk about. Um, in a sense, my starting point was the c comparison between humans, human society, and chimpanzee society, since they are the various types of chimpanzees are the, are the, are our closest relatives in the animal world. And when we compare uh, human society and chimpanzee societies, two um, features seem to stand out, and they're the ones which interest me. The first one is that chimpanzee societies are fairly small. They seem to never get beyond 100 or so, and that's quite a lot. So the groups are only about that sort of size. And the other uh, feature is that there seems to be no idea that of, of, of a continuity of the group beyond what it actually is at a particular moment. Um, there's no notion that our group existed before us, uh, the members of the group now, and that it will exist in the future as in, with an identity um, after us. While quite clearly, this is, uh, these two factors are quite different in human societies. Human societies can be very, very large indeed. Though I should warn you, the word society is a tri tricky one. I'm not going to define it now, because to a certain extent my talk is precisely about what we mean by that term. Uh, and quite clearly, human societies have um, this imagination of continuing through time, quite beyond the, life, uh, the, the lifetime of individuals. The reason for these limitations of chimpanzee societies are quite simple, and that is that although chimpanzees have very great capacities for, for social interaction with other individuals, these are limited to the other individuals with whom they are at the time in contact. Uh, they, they read each other's minds. I mean, a lot of it is also the memory of previous uh, interactions, but they read each other's minds uh, in the way that humans do, though we do it rather better. They um, interact with one or more individuals, uh, but that's it. That means that there are obviously sheer of strong limitations on memory in the number of people that can be within a group. And also, because it, uh, chimpanzee societies are about actually occurring relations or memories of previously occurring relations, there's no possibility for this idea that they are, let us say, the replacement of their group 50 years before or 50 years, or that they will be the, the ancestors of that group 50 years hence. So one can describe the, relationship, the social relationships of chimpanzees as in terms of continual transactions, extremely fluid transactions, because they're, they're, they're sort of watching out for each other, uh, adapting to each other, building alliances, and so on. Now, that type of social, the social of understanding others' minds, uh, is also found in human beings. 
We do this all the time. As I say, we probably do it rather better than chimpanzees. We read each other's minds. We try to understand each other's words. We build alliances. We build, uh, we have social strategies. So there's a sense in which um, we can say that there is an aspect of human society which is also transactional, based on the continual transactions of individuals. And one can say a bit more about this by stressing that what seems to be essential in this sort of relationships among human beings is understanding the intention of the people with whom we're interacting. Uh, in a sense, there are, this is even true of language. Many linguistic utterances that we produce only make full sense when we imagine what was the intention of the person who produces them. And therefore, in the intentionality of the other people with whom we're in contact with is key. In fact, I would I'll probably argue it's the most important aspect of what I've called, will call the transactional social. Uh, and similarly, as is in the case of ch chimpanzees, this leads to the relations being continually, being highly fluid. You know, for, it's a matter often, often of microseconds and mi to microseconds that we read the intentions of others, what they're tr uh, trying to communicate or do to us. Um, and these change all the time. Alliances change uh, or, or, uh, with uh, extraordinary fluidity. Uh, now, there is certainly this fluidity in human beings, but there is something more. And I think the reason why there is something more is because we have, on top of this transactional level of the social, a level which in a, is a denial of the fluidity, the the continual change of um, interaction. And at this level has to be in imagination because the reality of things is that we're, in, we're continually um, interacting, modifying our own activities. If there is going to be a level which appears fixed in time, uh, this has to be in imagination. It also has to be in shared imagination because if it is going to have some social significance, it has to be shared by the people who are interacting. But there is, therefore, a kind of double level to human society, which I would call transcendental. Transcendental, uh, without going into the problems of what Kant meant by this, uh, is much, uh, I mean in a much simpler way, simply that it transcends time. That it, or perhaps one could say uh, it ignores time. Um, so examples of this transcendental are probably very familiar. Uh, n large numbers of social scientists have stressed how groups, many groups in the human social are can only exist in imagination. For example, groups such as clans in traditional societies uh, do not imply that people have anything to do with each other. They, they do not imply uh, that you know, members of clans can live quite separately from each other. They may have very little to do with each other, yet in a, they have a sense that they are one, or very often this is the very f words that they use. And they can also easily say, you know, we came to this valley 200 years ago, which of course it wasn't them. The we, because the word, the, 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 the pronoun we is extraordinarily interesting actually in social science uh, and in linguistics too. Um, and also, we will still be there in 100 years time. Although this, 
and nations is a very similar, can say the same sort of thing. It sounds very straightforward, though as soon as we begin to try to pin down what is involved in this imaginary continuation, uh, is, it, it becomes very vague and difficult. And perhaps the other element of the transcendental that one can talk about in a very short uh, lecture like this is what we mean is what are often called roles. Uh, to take an example uh, much discussed by the philosopher John Searle uh, when he talks about husbands and wives. Husbands and wives stay husbands and wives irrespective of what they, you know, what they feel about each other, which probably changes all the time. Uh, they may even sort of, one of them may live in one continent, another one may live in another one, but there is a sense in which they are husbands and wives all the same, which somehow must be separated from the empirical manifestations that the two people are there. So again, there is quite clearly in human society an imaginary level which transcends time, which is quite absent in chimpanzee societies. Roles may exist in the sense that they're negotiated from moment to moment, but they do not transcend the actual interaction. So what I would argue in very general terms is that human beings have these two levels, a kind of imaginary level of society as well as a transactional one, a transcendental and a transactional one. Um, and that um, chimpanzee societies uh, do not. They've only got the transactional, which also we've got. Um, now, to say that there is an imagined, shared imagined level in human society, which in fact what distinguishes us from our nearest cousins, uh, is, I mean, first of all, it presents a, a practical problem to somebody like myself, uh, who's an anthropologist who goes to places and tries to study people. I spent a lot of my time, as Anne said, uh, work, working at Madagascar, and that is that we can't really go into people's brains to see what their, those shared representations are. Um, and to a certain extent, this is a problem for the people themselves. Uh, they may well feel that they have shared representations, uh, sh shared imag imaginary representations, but they cannot exactly they couldn't put their finger on, obviously not put their finger on, on what those shared representations, or even know exactly whether theirs are, the, are, are really identical with um, uh, those of other people, though they usually assume that they are. Uh, but luckily, uh, these shared imaginary representations are not purely mental phenomena. Uh, luckily both for the anthropologists and for the people we study. It's as though they emerge at certain times uh, in the sort of social process which we and they observe. And so I'm going to, so that what I'm talking about becomes less abstract, uh, I'm going to give you an example of one of these emergen emergences, uh, and there are, no, there, there are quite a lot of them, to give you an idea of both how it is that I know something about uh, these shared representations and that how people in the society have an idea that those representations are shared. Um, in a sense, uh, these, these emergences give us a handle uh, to understand the un, uh, un, non-empirical, well, non-mental non nature of the shared representations. 
And so I'm going to talk about what happens every morning uh, in houses in a Malagasy village, which I've been studying on almost 50 years now, uh, which is one great advantage of being old. And uh, there's a reason why it's particularly interesting for us to, 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 to look at this sort of village, however remote it is in the Malagasy forest uh, of the East Coast. It's a place, and there are a few around in the world, where the state has no significance. Uh, I don't know if any of you know, know the work of Pierre Clastre or uh, of Jim Scott. Uh, they've both talked about places where there seems to be an active rejection of, of, of various states. Uh, and therefore, I think one can say that a, a place like that uh, is, gives us an indication of what it's like to live without a state. It's not quite the same as rejecting the state as never having one. But of course, not having a state is typical of the history of mankind. I mean, if we've been, if human be, if Homo sapiens has been around, uh, at the very least for 100,000 years. Um, and states sort of turned up, let's say, about 10,000 years ago. It's obvious that if we're trying to think about the characteristics of human beings, we really should think very much more about what it's like to live without a state than with, uh, the, than with a state. And also, for reasons I might be able to touch on later on, I think the coming of the state changes things absolutely fundamentally. So I'm going to ask you to think of the place that I'll be talking about as though it's a non-state society. Um, and it gives us a hint of what uh, societies were like uh, for most of our uh, human history. In fact, the reason why they live in such a sort of difficult place is precisely because they've tried to get, get away from the states which were uh, to, their, uh, to their west, uh, which tried to encroach on the, uh, on the areas where they lived, and the states which were to, the, to their east, to the east, and so they went in, uh, and this decay, uh, they, they went in an area where states couldn't bother them too much and they go out of their way even to this very day to make sure that state institutions only come in a very, very minor way. All right, so what happens early in the morning in, uh, in, the, kind of, in the villages I'm talking about, in the kind of houses w w where I was living? And since I was living there a long time, I, what I would be describing, I've seen hundreds of times. So, very simple houses, just one room. Uh, one wakes up in the morning, usually uh, the, the, the older woman in the house begins, well, young men sort of split a bit of wood outside if there isn't any ready, and then she begins to, to build a fire and pretend, and. Uh, and prepares the breakfast. People sort of half wake up, talk to each other a bit, uh, and they seem to disappear in, in the forest around because to defecate and sort of wander around a bit like ghosts, but then not talking too much. But it's all fairly straightforward kind of interaction. Um, people have breakfast. Then after breakfast, the house is, the, the room is tidied up. Uh, to a certain extent. The reason why it's tidied up is because the, let, let, I'm simplifying things, but the older couple in the house who are the focus of the owners of the house are getting ready to receive visits. Uh, what they do is that they sit in the northeast end of the house, which is that of superiors, and of old, older people. And the visitors 
are representatives of the houses of their children who are nearby. So these representatives come and they stay in the opposite end of the room, in the area which marks um, a junior status and an inferior status. So already in how the thing is set up, the relation, the kinship, the, the key kinship relation can, is, all for, is all for everybody to, to be seen. When these um, children have come, an, inter uh, an exchange, a linguistic exchange, takes place between the elders in one end of the room and the children at the other end of the room. This exchange is extremely beautiful in many ways because it, it's sung. It's a, a, a sung exchange between uh, the, the two parties where the main content, I mean, apart from a whole series of various forms of greetings, is the, ch the, the children ask for their, for their blessing from the older people, their blessing really for a successful day, a successful li li life, a successful uh, fertile life, uh, because it's very important to have children and descendants. Uh, so, so it, and what I want to stress is that what is the, 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 what is said or sung or intoned, I don't know what these, uh, how one would draw the difference between all these things, is exactly the same every morning, exactly the same for all the different uh, lots of children who come one after the other. These exchanges sort of last about 10 minutes or so. But of course, if there are lots of children who come in succession, it goes on for quite a while in the morning. Uh, now, I, I want to, 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 to stop and think what is actually involved in these moments. Before, remember, all sorts of things were going on in, in, in a particular order. Afterwards, similar sorts of things. Even the people who engage in the, in the sung exchanges may sort of from time to time sort of have a different kind of conversation, uh, uh, an unscripted conversation with somebody sitting next to them. Uh, but still, the pattern of the sung greetings occur. Uh, and occur in exactly the same form. So what can one say about what is going on? Well, one very obvious aspect is that they're acting out their kinship roles. They're acting out the roles of the, the older generation, the senior generation, the more authoritative uh, kinship roles, and those of the children their positions, their bodily positions, because I should have said something about their bodily positions, mark this hierarchy, which is the key element in, in, in the system. And of course, what, what is sung by the children is, marks their roles as children. What is sung by the older people is, marks their role as older people and as givers, givers of blessing, uh, asking for blessing. So that's the first thing. It sort of is a kind of theater for a moment of the kinship roles. The other kind of, uh, uh, the other aspect that I, I'd like to stress is that there is absolutely no information, no new information given in those exchanges since they're repeated exactly the same every day. You know, the, the, the actual events of the lives uh, of people just cannot be taken in. You, you, can't, you, you can't bring in information about the specificity of the situation. Um, you, otherwise, obviously, you wouldn't be repeating the same phrases. Uh, and also, the, uh, and I think probably that is the most important aspect. 
I want to sort of concentrate on the, on the aspect that they're repeating exactly the same things. Um, it means, um, perhaps I'll be jumping, uh, jumping ahead of myself, but saying that to, 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 to be there and to say uh, and, uh, and to perform that exchange means that you've abandoned your own intentionality. Quite obviously, if your words are not your, your own words, you know, the words that you say at such a moment, uh, it is not, there is no, the meaning of those words cannot be attributed to the intentionality of the speakers. In contrast to what I was saying earlier, and I was saying, you know, what we understand each other, uh, uh, the way we understand each other is by reading others, uh, each other's intentionality. There's absolutely no point in doing that. You'd be wasting your time. Um, so the, the, the actors in the exchange have abandoned, if you like, their character as particular people, omitting uh, emitting messages which inform uh, each other about intentionalities. They've also abandoned, uh, and that of course applies to, 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 to the linguistic side of things, it also imply, it, it applies to the body, because of course bodily positions, eye contact and so on, are also indicators of intentionality. So they've, uh, they've given uh, this up. And um, the other aspect is that it doesn't matter how many children come in a way as far as the nature of the structure of the relationship is. Every, every group of children who come just repeat exactly the same kinds of things. Uh, also, uh, and I would argue that what is being evoked in that exchange is not, not, not quite obviously not a matter of people relating to each other, but of what I would call an algorithm, uh, or a, a, a system of roles which are implied as tying up with each other around the central role of parents and children. Uh, but of course, in a particular role, you know, roles of parents and children imply all sorts of uh, other roles, husbands, wives, grandparents, and so on. So, which comes from the absence of de-peopling, the, the, de-peopling the actors, if you see what I mean, by saying that they're not people, and replacing them by a kind of abstract system of kinship roles, where the positions do not specify the number of people. In a sense, the position of children are the same whether they are 10 or 1. And in a very interesting way, um, absent children are implied by the actions of the ones who are there. Because one assumes, quite rightly, that if they were there, they would be taking on those roles. So one just forgets about the particular parents and children. And there's another aspect which comes from the fact that time has been abolished in these exchanges. It's been abolished quite explicitly by the notion of blessing, because what the parents are doing in these exchanges is passing on what one might well call the life force that is in them to their children, but assumed is that the, this life force which they have as older people they have got from previous uh, their own parents going back ever, f ever further, who were probably dead. So what is appearing is the moment, is a visible moment in a continuity which, is, uh, which one can imagine going on from almost any time in the past to any time in the future. Uh, Anyway, since, the, since 
what is being expressed in the, in the performance is so abstract, a matter of relationships without people. Uh, it is in the very nature of something like an algorithm that it is timeless. So this is the emergence. I, I think this is the kind of emergence of a shared system, which has, you may well have noticed, exactly the characteristics which I was talking about uh, as those which distinguish um, humans from chimpanzees. The, bit, the thing is expandable, because it doesn't matter how many children are there. It's actually expandable well beyond the empirical, because it actually uh, can generate an, an infinity number of people. It, it can generate an, it does, it can't gen it, the, the roles can involve an infinite, an, infinite, an infinite number of people. And it also has this timelessness it's sort of, if that was the society, if that was the real society, it would last forever, or at least would not be, last is not the right phrase, it would not be attached to the moment. Uh, and this is very much the experience. Now, I think this is, as I say, very useful for the anthropologist to get some idea of what it is which is a shared social it's shared imaginary social. It's also, I think, extremely important in how this shared imaginary social becomes shared in the minds of the people, because to a certain extent, they, they, they've witnessed, if I've witnessed it hundreds of times, they've witnessed it thousands of times, um, and so on. Does that therefore mean that we have the explanation of this fundamental difference between human society and chimpanzee society? Well, not quite. There's a problem. And the problem is that what I've been arguing is that what is evoked through these emergences is very largely in shared imagination. How can it have a practical result that would mean that human society has, is so different from that of chimpanzee society? Well, I think the answer to that is that, of course, that image of society which you have in uh, the greetings doesn't disappear when the emergences end uh, any more than the interactional, transactional society which, which people live in. One can think of them, if you like, as resources uh, along which action can take place. And what seems to go on uh, is that as people trip in and out of emergences of one type of uh, system to another, they are taking the opportunities to enlarge their society in, in, in indefinitely and to imagine that their society is going on forever. For example, uh, it makes sense to start to accumulate objects, uh, as indeed these people I'm talking about, and to transmit them to other, to, 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 to future generations, because these future generations are them, in a strange way, way and to transmit what they've got from the past, uh, because it was them who, ma who made these things. So there's a kind of accumulation, more, very importantly, there's an accumulation of knowledge, which probably is one of the keys by which human cultures uh, progress in their technical capacities. Uh, because what happens is people refer to one or other of these systems, but that they're both running in parallel uh, in their minds. Now, since uh, this is a religious uh, studies department, or at least uh, uh, Anne Tavis, who is the person who invited me, and who is in the religious depart studies department, uh, I'm going to sort of slightly leave the Malagasy in the forest, uh, slightly leave these evolutionary, uh, these evolutionary um, 
considerations aside, to think of what it might mean for what uh, for let us say religious studies. Uh, I think the first thing to remember is that anything that the English word religion can evoke is a very, very recent phenomenon. Uh, in fact, I would probably argue that what is evoked by, by, by the English word uh, um, religion only applies to the Abrahamic religion. When, it's, when, when people start to talk of Hinduism or Buddhism in its traditional form, as one, uh, by the English, you call it by the English word religion, it just leads to misunderstanding. It's just pushing on uh, what the, uh, the semantic word means. So if we go back to the idea that human beings have been going on around, uh, have been around for 100,000 years, it means that uh, 95 or 99 percent of their existence they, have, they, do, they have not had religion. Uh, and there I'm just using the word as I think is in what it evokes. Um, on the other hand, I think they've had the kind of thing I'm talking about. The reason why I, uh, I think they have the kind of thing that I'm talking about is because it is what makes the possibility of human society being so completely different to that of chimpanzees. If insofar as, the, I don't know when, when this sort of begins, but insofar um, as um, they um, have been at all the similar kinds of phenomena that we mean by human societies, they must have had this double system uh, that, that I've been talking about, one of which uh, through ritual, through the abolition of individual intentionality, uh, which comes automatically from ritual, uh, they've, they, they've been able to, they've been in societies which have these double levels. If they didn't have these double levels, I don't think we'd recognize them more or less uh, as human. I think actually there are a few, there are people who don't, but that's right, in very exceptional circumstances uh, and, uh, and not very normal. And I hope to argue in the th what I have not so far published, because what I'm talking about is to certain extent refers to what I have published so far, uh, that the coming of the state act as a kind of, it becomes parasitic on the kind of situation that I've been talking about. It, it's parasitic in, first of all, the way that if you look at early states, what they do is they go out of their way to destroy this ima shared imaginary level of the local. Uh, so there's tremendous, they're, they're extraordinarily brutal early states. <laughs> They involve killing people in large numbers. And it's some of the, some of the most repetitive features of these early states. And of course, the destruction is in, order to, is in order to attempt to replace this imaginary timeless level by an ideology which would then be tied to the state, uh, which, um, and I think if you look at the historical cases of the growth of states, you'll see this inevitable two sides of destruction and attempted construction. It never gets very far. But if you think of uh, the early Egyptian states, they were pretty successful in, 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 building, in, in building the representation of the state as though it was one big Malagasy village, if you like, uh, associated with ideas of fertility, which we've seen already um, in the notions of blessing. Um, so this is just one state, uh, stage, if you like, I think, in the history of mankind. And also why I think one doesn't really see these two levels as clearly as in that rather, as in the example that I gave you of, of the emergence 
of this tr uh, transcendental level. So I'll stop here because I'm, so we can have a few questions. This is what you, uh, you suggested. the microphone here for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor, for that talk. Um, I wonder if you might be able to elaborate a bit on your last point. In some of your work, you talk about how the destruction of the state on smaller communities depends on making them, um, I believe you say, transcendentally incomplete. That's right. And I wonder if you might elaborate a bit. Well, I mean, it, 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 obviously this is a historical question, but I mean, if you, let, let's take the example of Egypt, since I mentioned Egypt. Uh, if you look at uh, pre-dynastic Egypt, uh, the, my archeological friends uh, sort of uh, uh, now s uh, see the sort of an, a, an attempt to disrupt the kinship and to a certain extent the cultic organization of the groups which they absorb. You know, if they start off fairly small uh, dominant group which absorb and, destroy, uh, and try to, to destroy the, 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 the completeness of the organization of a place like the one that I described. Um, so that they make themselves necessary, if you like. Uh, The, the, the rulers make themselves necessary. Hi, um, yeah, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, sort of along similar lines, I was interested in understanding better the difference between the ideology of the state or the shared imagination and that that exists prior to the state in 95%, as you said, of, of our existence. Um. I'm sorry, I haven't really answered this question. Part so, of it. so yeah, you, so you were speaking about the when the state emerges, like how they try to destroy this sort of shared ideology or this transcendental yeah. nature, that the, this transcendental level that we exist they on. They destroy and, so, and attempt to create it as well. I mean, for right, themselves. exactly. But but what I'm interested in is the difference between the the ideology or the um, transcendental level that the state tries to replace the one that naturally sort of occurs right. before. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I understand exactly what you mean. I mean, first of all, this process continually goes on. States continually create themselves. So, I mean, I, I gave the example, you know, what are the f earliest states we know uh, with Egypt, but you can, but, but this process goes on continually as, as, as dominant groups try to establish themselves from just a sort of brutal gang into an apparently timeless uh, natural phenomena. They're endlessly trying to do that. They, they, they often usually don't get that long to do it, and therefore it's a very incomplete uh, attempt. Um, yeah. So and the second question is uh, about how different it is. Well. What I would sort of say is that the key issue that they try to take over is the source of fertility, the source of fertility writ large. Uh, in other words, the ability to, to, to produce, to continue to live, uh, because uh, very much linked with what I sort of got a glimpse of in these emergencies is the organization of the idea of the continual of the of, of continuing life and um, they try to centralize it to somehow make it into uh, the the ruler but of course the problem about the rulers is rulers are not atemporal and therefore you know it, it's the ruler's position rather than the ruler that they have to 
the political situation in, in, in early states and in later states is how to play those contradictory facts of the actual ruler and an eternal ruler. Uh, you know, the old discussions of the king's two bodies uh, in, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, I, I like very much your uh, idea of the uh, this transcendental uh, relationship that's created through the greetings. Uh, I think uh, having observed this over so many years, I can imagine that uh, one thing that must happen is some of the elders uh, get older and perhaps uh, their children become older. Is there a sense of uh, in the moment of death, someone new is going to occupy that space and, uh, and so know, is there a transcendental a transcending yeah. even of the generation such you're, that you're obviously right but to a certain extent the theater that is being acted out makes this irrelevant of course it isn't irrelevant but it is a, a matter of making you know, it, it, what is being expressed is the relationship between elders and juniors and the transmission of blessing uh, and therefore of course of course, the children will replace the parents. But not only that, I mean, if you look at it in more details, of course, the children of the children do exactly the same thing mm. in, the, in, in, the in, in the people who were one moment with, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the children in their parents' houses. Their children begin to do exactly the same thing. So there's a, almost a deliberate attempt to abolish time. Uh, or make time irrelevant rather than abolished. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I'm, I've got a couple different pictures here um, or stories. Uh, on the one hand, as I'm hearing it, that this kind of timeless um, way of being of the villagers uh, where it's, you know, it's kind of just rolls over maybe centuries and millennia, but it could. It's, 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 it, it, it's acted out, isn't it? Yeah, it appears that way. So we have that which seems kind of sustainable in a way, you know, a, a way of being that could be more, I'm, I'm reading maybe more into it. And then on the other hand, we have this other, I have this other picture I'm hearing of these kind of proto-empires absorbing them and, and turning them into this more hierarchical, less uh, temporal, more temporal um, kind of thing. And what I'm interested in is if, from your kind of observations of these, which I picked up a little bit, only a little bit myself, if there's any insights that you have into what that's innate in us that supports a more sustainable, timeless way of being versus this um, you know, temporal way that seems to be kind of taking over the world and destroying, you know, our societies and everything else. And do you have any insights well, into... Well, well, I mean, what, what I've question? been talking about, I, I think, has implications for the process of history. It means that there are continual attempts at uh, keeping certain features of our society or indeed of our culture out of process. I think they always fail, but there are continual attempts. And I think the, the um, removal of individual in, in, intentionality in the understanding of the phenomena is absolutely classical. But of course, you know, I mean, uh, empires always uh, want to represent themselves as having always existed, or at least they're probably more interested in always existing in the future but they don't. <laughs> I think we've got one last question that we can take over here, and then we've got uh, some stuff set up in there for a reception, and you can continue the conversation in the other room. But let's have this one last one. Thank you. Um, in the history of your observations, how developed was the protocol, if any, um, when it came time for the juniors to assume the role of an elder? I'm sorry, I, I haven't written it in here properly. Uh, 
um, in your observations, yes, when it came time for um, a younger person to assume the role of an elder, how developed was the protocol for the assumption of that? Uh, not developed at all is the answer. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there are cases w where there are quite elaborate uh, evolved protocols. For example, in Japan, there are moments when the older generation should retire and mm -hmm. uh, m m move out uh, from actually literally move uh, to, to different part of the house. This isn't like that. I mean, uh, the idea is that Elders are elders always, they go senile, they're still their elders, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but of course, uh, they die. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess Putting that's very uh, uh, and, 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 and they've been taken over long before they die often. But, uh, but, but, but the representation of the system is it never dies, you see. It, one of the things about what, 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 I mean, what I mentioned I was talking about blessing is that it has an image of going back eternally. You know, the, 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 the blessers have been blessed and, the, and they have in a turn been blessed and so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. And so on. Uh, um. But since the Madagascar haven't been there eternally on Madagascar, uh, it's obviously not so. <laughs> if only for that reason. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, 